Welcome back to Getting Unstuck, Educators Leading Change. While all of the educators with whom we speak continue to wrestle with near-term issues brought on by COVID-19, especially how do we open school next year, many suggest that COVID-19 gives us the opportunity to pause and look at broader reforms to education. In light of that thinking, we welcome you to our special Summer Professional Development Series. Tomorrow, how might we reimagine our schools? In his book, Great by Choice, Jim Collins tells the following metaphorical story. Picture yourself at sea, a hostile ship bearing down on you. You have a limited amount of gunpowder. You take all your gunpowder and use it to fire a big cannonball. The cannonball flies out over the ocean and misses the target, off by 40 degrees. You turn to your stockpile and discover that you're out of gunpowder. You die. But suppose instead that when you see the ship bearing down, you take a little bit of gunpowder and fire a bullet. It misses by 40 degrees. You make another bullet and fire. It misses by 30 degrees. You make a third bullet and fire, missing by only 10 degrees. The next bullet hits, ping, the hull of the oncoming ship. Now you take all the remaining gunpowder and fire a big cannonball along the same line of sight, which sinks the enemy ship. You live. In a variation of that story for education, we see many well-intentioned thought leaders and practitioners firing a lot of well-intended bullets to improve education. Educational leaders and schools are barraged with suggestions and directives to do this and that. But the problem is that we don't have an agreement on what they're supposed to be firing at. The target. In Colin's story, the target was a hostile ship. If we look at education, the target has to be what kind of school and educational experiences kids really need given the world we live in today, and not for a world that existed more than 100 years ago. This special series will try to turn up the volume on a much-needed discussion about the target, the educational system that will best serve kids in the community and world in which they will live and work. We'll hear from practitioners working in the schools as well as from outside thought leaders. So welcome to Getting Unstuck. Um, One of those helping us on the journey of change is Ted Dintersmith. And I want um, a special call out to our friend and fellow podcaster, Steve Mileto. Um, I actually heard uh, an interview that Ted did with Steve. And I said, boy, we've got to get uh, Ted on our on our show, because um, as you'll hear, uh, Ted is all about uh, change in education, which is uh, near and dear to our heart. And um, so I, I got in touch with with Steve, I got in touch with Ted, and, and here we are. And we'll talk a little bit about your book in a, in a few minutes. Um, uh, so Getting Unstuck has, has for the last um, year plus, been focused on change in general. And what we mean there is that we're all about helping individuals and organizations undergo productive change. And that is change that really helps them to achieve their desired outcomes and I- desired impact. With, the, with our book coming out in a month, um, Shifting How School Leaders Can Create a Culture of Change, we are, we are shifting our focus on our podcast to s- talk specifically about change in education. Um, and having been, um, all of us have been, all three of us have been in education, myself, Kirsten, and our, our third author, Margaret Zakay, um, have been in education for quite some time. So this change in education is near and dear to our heart. And uh, when I heard um, when I heard Ted on Steve's podcast and then did a little research, I went to his, his LinkedIn page and it says he's a change agent. And I thought that was one of the most succinct introductions uh, that anybody could have. Because uh, normally on LinkedIn, we have these very long and lengthy things that describe who we are. And under Ted, it's change agent. So, uh, Ted, um, I know you focus on change in education, uh, but you didn't start there. Give us the skinny on your background. How did you get to where you are today? Yeah, I spent most of my career in the world of innovation. So I was with a, an operating entity for seven years and then in venture capital for 25 years. Um, you know, backing entrepreneurs, sort of understanding, having a ringside seat to the you know, entrepreneurial ecosystem and you know when i started you know which was hmm, 1981 it was a, a really narrow sliver of our overall economy 
Um, and it's a much, much bigger part of it. And, and we're headed to a world where it's all of it. And, and, you know, I think that you go back to 1980, 1970s, whatever, it, most of the last century, the jobs that were out there were jobs that had, you know, job descriptions and labor grades and, you know, tight, defined criteria for how you advance and very specific criteria for what you do in your job. You know, that economy has gone. And, and, mm. and so, so I, I kind of came out of my career and venture with a couple of observations or insights. You know, one was how fast machine intelligence is changing the world and that the impact on career and ultimately on citizenship, on community is, is not a little thing. It's a massive, massive shift. Um, and the second thing, which was more kind of a side criteria, but, but early in venture and, and in my hiring approach, I would look for people with incredible academic credentials and grew skeptical of that over time, actually over a fairly short time, and, and found that academic superstars, by and large, were not going to be the type of people to really thrive in a, in a very uncertain, dynamic, risk-prone risk world of innovation. And it's not 100%, but I, I often look for people with really unconventional backgrounds. That's what I like to, to hire and, and to back. And somebody that just kind of had done everything right to get through the school process and be a Baker Scholar at Harvard Business School, you know, honestly, I found that they were probably better suited for a consulting firm or an investment bank, but not for the world of innovation. Boom. And so when you put those together and you think, well, the world's becoming increasingly shaped by innovation when even our academic superstars are being ill-prepared for that world, and when anything routine will be done by machines, you start to see the tsunami headed our way that sort of begs for, I think, code red responses in terms of what we do to prepare, particularly young adults, our children and young adults, for a world that none of us can predict. So I, I of course, uh, looked at your TEDx talk. And um, you mentioned, uh, speaking of your kids, part of your impetus for getting involved more deeply in education was what you saw happening with your kids. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and it was, it was, there were probably two or three things that stood out as they were growing up, but it was a general sense that as I observed what they were being rewarded for, yeah. I felt that's not very useful. And what I observed what they were being discouraged from doing, I said, wait a minute, something's really wrong with that. And, um, you know, I could give a million examples, but I'll, I'll pick one is our, our son, in middle school was required to take an art course and uh, signed up for what he wanted and didn't get anything he wanted. So he had to take pottery and, you know, not exactly high priority for, for a sports oriented, you know, young teenager um, came home one day and said, I figured out what it takes to get a good grade. Just do something normal and add three things that are weird and it'll, it'll do just fine. And then the second year he signed up again because it was mandatory the second year. And uh, he, first three choices, didn't get those pottery again. <laughs> it was like, whoa. So he, so he said like, like he was really into at the time building bridges and he, he sort of pitched his school on replacing pottery with designing and building a bridge and doing some, you know, analysis or research on what makes for an aesthetic bridge and maybe getting into some of the things that make for a structurally sound bridge. Seemed to me like a good alternative to pottery too. And, uh, you know, of course, the school's response, and, and uh, you know, some level I get it and some level I don't, but the school's response was, no, we can't do that because it would set a bad precedent. And I sort of felt like if your students take the initiative to propose something to you and can direct their own efforts to do it, and it's interesting, isn't that a precedent you want to set? And, and no, it was, no, that would be a bad precedent. And so I took pottery again. Um, you know, ironically, you know, at, at age 23, he's, he, you know, produces and creates videos. So, you know, so he did find, he did find an artistic lane, uh, despite pottery. But, um, you know, and there was two or three of those things that just sort of made me think, wait a minute, something may not be right. Particularly, and I'd sort of underscore this, in a context where I'm sort of surrounded by everybody else who thinks this all makes sense. And, and so it's one thing when you look at something and say, whoa, this doesn't make sense. And everybody else says, this doesn't make sense. It's a, quite a different thing when you look at it and say, I, not only do I not think it doesn't make sense, I actually kind of know it doesn't make sense. I mean, if you, 
if you discourage kids from being bold and audacious and taking a leadership role in their learning and creating and pursuing an initiative that they feel will make their world better and will help them learn important things, if that's not encouraged, if instead they're encouraged to just do what they're told to do, I know from the way I, where our world is headed. I mean, the one thing I know a fair amount is what, what these dynamics are that are going to reshape our world. I know the first set of characteristics is what we want in our young adults. And the second set of characteristics is what we don't want. You know, I often use, the, it's a quote from a senior person at Apple Computer who said, we've decided any employee who needs a boss is no longer employable. Mm. <laughs> right? You know, wow. if, and we don't want, who do you want as a family member, as a community member, as an employee, or as a colleague? You want somebody that can figure out something valuable to do and then take the initiative, draw on resources appropriately, hold themselves and everybody around them to a high standard and get something done that everybody's excited about and proud of. That's what we want. And, and yet that's not what happens in most of school. You know, most of school is jumping through these hoops to satisfy the very you know, unfortunate priorities of people like college admissions officers or state legislators or graduate school or more graduate school, you know, and, and you just sort of say, well, wait a minute, if, if what we're telling our kids is the most important thing in life is to jump through hoops you actually find to be meaningless, just to satisfy a 28-year-old anonymous college admissions officer, and, and then you look at what you're getting good at, and you say, that's pretty dang irrelevant. Yeah, you know, that to me is code red. That to me screams for a strong voice that says, wait, we can do so much better than that. So um, you noticed what was going on in the world that we're becoming much more of a machine work culture and that we weren't preparing kids for that. Uh, there was much more demand for innovation. As a parent, you noticed uh, that there were things amiss um, in your in your children's education, a lot of people would have stopped there. They could have been angry, disappointed, grumbling. You didn't stop there. You actually got in your car and started visiting all fifty states. Can you take it from there, Ted? Yeah, yeah. you know there are days. I'll tell you, there are days I say, "Why didn't I stop there?" <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as you guys know, it's a hard challenge, right? Um, and I often note, I mean, it, it's with, with some degree of, of irony that when I was in venture, what was perfect for me is when 99.9% .9 of the world was wrong and I could find the, uh, that one person that was right and back them. You know, now it's like a very different challenge of trying to convince 99.9% .9 of the world, hey, wait a minute, we can do much better. Um, but I actually started with, you know, I, I, I may ultimately have zero impact on, and I understand that, but... Um, but I, I, I think I have a strategy. And so I actually started with a film. You know, I had seen like uh, Waiting for Superman, which I thought was insulting um, and just completely missed any important point. Uh, I, there are other films that are done that basically cater to really rich parents who worry about their kid being too stressed getting into college. And it's kind of like, I'll make a film to get everybody else to cut back, but I'm not gonna cut back so my kid can finally get ahead. I mean, it kind of doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but I said, let's start with a film. I did a search, found a great director. We did this film called Most Likely to Succeed. Did really well in the film festival circuit. So Sundance, Tribeca, AFI, maybe a couple dozen major film festivals. I turned down Netflix, which everybody said, oh, you're turning down, what, you can't turn down Netflix? That, what a dumb move that is, Ted. And, you know, like I do make a lot of dumb moves, but that wasn't one of them. And, and we took it directly to school communities to, for them to screen it. But but just as I don't think kids learn when they sit alone on their laptop and absorb content, I don't think we could help schools change if a few people around a school watch something alone, not even knowing who else was watching it, and think about it and say, oh, they're probably right, or that's an interesting point, and that got me thinking. So instead, we've supported the school community models, you know, community screening model. We've done, in four years, 10,000 school community screenings, 35 different countries, there are emerging big practices in Japan and Australia. Um, and what it's done is it brings people together. The film, it doesn't proselytize. It doesn't dictate. It doesn't say, here's something better. It says, here's something different. Watch it and make up your own mind. You know, it's new. It might not be for you. What do you think? Kids working collaboratively on big, ambitious projects that they think are really interesting. Kids can't wait to get to school every day. Teachers trusted to teach to their passions and expertise. What do you think? 
And, and, you know, of course, as you guys know, you guys are experts. It's what we're showing is not a new fad. I mean, this is really ultimately the way anybody's ever learned throughout history. Um, but the movie was artistically great. And I give Greg Whiteley, the, the director and his team, enormous credit. And then we had a model that I think was an effective model for getting it out there and getting communities to think about this really important issue of what priorities do we have for our kids as they move through these precious years of school. But as I traveled with the film, people made a lot of observations. I had a lot of discussions. I started traveling with it. But one of the things people said was, and I think it's a really key point, is they said, you know, the film you feature, which is a school in San Diego, High Tech High, started from scratch with a fair amount of money. I am in an existing school with a very limited budget. You know, and I actually believe this is true. I think that any of your listeners, if you took any of your listeners and gave them a big wad of money and said, start a school from scratch, they'd come up with something incredible, particularly if they weren't, con if they didn't feel constrained by parent expectations or college admissions criteria mm -hmm. or state legislation. We know, I mean, that's one of the things that blows me away. Our, our teachers in the field know what engages kids, what inspires them and what helps them develop skills that matter. But how do you help an existing school change? So that's when I took that trip. Uh, I went to uh, all 50 states. It was basically for an entire school year. So I left home, you know, mid-September 2015, finished the trip late June 2016, you know, hired a team to plan out every minute of every day. So it was intense. Um, and, and I didn't start the trip with any kind of a book in mind. But toward the end, I just said, boy, there's been so many interesting things I've seen and observed. And these teachers were so unbelievably generous in sharing their stories with me. I owe it, I think, to them, to, to people anyway, broadly, to try to write a good book. So I, I spent a year, wrote a book. Well, actually, I wrote two books. I wrote my first draft, which I threw out. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> what, what you learn as you go, and my first draft was like, First I went here, then I went there, then I went there. It just had a million different things. And a lot of it was about how it affected me. And like, let's face it, I'm like an anonymous guy. Nobody cares how it affected me. Um, and so I got to the end of that book and I said, maybe I should reread it. I said, I don't know if I want to reread it. It's not that interesting. And I was so like, I figure if the author doesn't want to reread it, that's not a good sign. Uh, uh -oh. <laughs> so, so I dumped that. Uh, and uh, although I tipped to an author, I think if I had just deleted it, I would have been crushed. So I put it on a hard drive and said, I'll draw on a lot of this when I rewrite the book. Never looked at it again, but I felt like it wasn't a total waste of time, which of course it was. Um, but then stepped back and said, what, what were the overarching themes I saw? Yeah. Yeah. And came up with this idea. And if you read the book, you can say good idea or not. Um, although the book's done really well out there, um, of trying to pick an inspiring example from each state, but pick things that sort of fit thematically with certain focal points. So like, so it was a bit of a, of a you know, Rubik's, Rubik's Cube exercise, but I wanted to get several that would really show the power of K through 12 and teachers were trusted. So, okay, I had lots of K through 12. I had a great K through 12 example in every state, but which states would I narrow it down to? So, you know, I picked like 15 states and then, you know, college and then be like five. These were really blow away examples, whatever. And so I've got these thematic areas. I've got these great examples. But one of the points I wanted to make was, and I hope it comes across, is we don't need to invent something from scratch. This isn't nuclear fusion. Our classroom teachers know what to do. There are amazing things going on every day all around the country in every community, probably in almost every school. It's just that they're, right now they're in, they're in po almost isolated pockets. And, and oftentimes it's one lonely innovative teacher in a school who sort of gets fatigued or one really interesting school in a community that gets labeled as the alternative school for those kids. Right, right, right. And, and when it's isolated, discouraged, frowned upon, it, it gets... It, 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 people just, uh, and understandably, sort of at a point, get tired. And so what I wanted to do is they know what to do. How, what, what are ways we can then start to, to amplify that, to start spreading the successes? And there's a saying, and I think it was Peter Drucker who said, the way a person, the way organizations, whatever, the way we succeed in life is not dwelling on what we do poorly, but figuring out what we do well and do more of it. And that sort of defines my worldview here. What are we doing well? How do we do more of that? Because if we 
obsess about what we're doing poorly, it's a very discouraging narrative. And I think we do a lot of the discouraging narrative in U.S. education. That's so important because when we're, when we're thinking about change management, one of our orientations is a lot of times people approach change as if it was everything that's happened up to this moment is, is the old guard. And what actually works is to acknowledge, you know, if this is where we want to go in the future, what's already existing in the current state that helps us get there. So, and it, it act, when you ask questions like what's happening that's working well and how can we amplify it, the power and energy and ability to actually make a shift is very, very different. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I'll put in a plug. So, so anybody listening, the, they did not ask me to say this, but I'll put in a plug for the work you're doing and the book you have coming out. It, it is ultimately all about the change model. You know, it, if we in fact know what to do, if we're laboring against constraints that impede what we feel we need to do, how do you put in place the conditions that lead to safe, confidence-building change? And, and what I observed with the film is, you know, like I occasionally somebody would see the film and talk to me and say, this is great. We're, we're going to change everything all at once. We're just, we're just going to take a bulldozer and, and just blow it up. And like two, three months later, they say, ah, that didn't work too well. And, and so we, it sort of has evolved into this thing. You know, it's, it's all this stuff is on my website, but I just started a new nonprofit with Sir Ken Robinson called the URL is www.goboundless.org. And it's, all, it's around the safe, confidence-building small steps that lead to big change, but suggested in, in a coherent sequence that lets you build on one little success to another success to another success so that they're not random acts here, there, and everywhere that people, and I see this a lot, people will try something, say that was great, and then it just kind of disappears. So how do you actually present to people, suggest to people, there are some really great steps you can start taking. Give, create an environment around that school that celebrates, that encourages, that says, this would be great if you do it. Not in the context of everybody has to, but who wants to. Mm -hmm. And, and then as they develop confidence, expertise, and success with sometimes things that look very simple and, and harmless, but actually can end up being enormously powerful, where, where students start to take more voice in their learning, where the learning's more aligned with the real world, where the community is more connected and caring. And we're sort of picking these overarching themes and then traveling across the country, finding great examples of small steps that get you there doing great video work to capture that because I think we're quite good at video work. And then saying, you know, and I'm doing this in the state of Virginia right now, Hawaii, North Dakota, um, starting something in Nebraska this summer, where get the people at the top to give permission. I've got your back. If you're up for doing this, I'm excited. I'm not here to tell you you have to. I'm not here to say district, you've got to do it. I'm not here to say principal, you've got to do it. I'm not here to say teacher, you've got to do it. But if for those willing to give this a shot, I'm excited for you. And as you make progress and develop your own steps that are really exciting, we'd love to hear about them. And if they're really great, we'll come film it mm. and put that into a global free resource that people can then draw on. And it's sort of an inspiring celebration model instead of a top-down dictated model. And I think, I think we've seen, right? We've, we've lived through 20 years of largely uninformed people at the top telling people in the field what they have to do. And, and the people in the field just say, like, I had no voice in it. I don't think it makes right. sense. And now you're telling me I'm going to be held accountable to high stakes tests tied to something I don't think makes sense. You know, it's hard to keep your morale up under those circumstances. But what we find with this grassroots teacher-led model is that teachers suddenly rediscover the passion they had for entering the profession. And I think if we can start unleashing that potential in our teachers and particularly unleashing it in our students and sort of model what we want our kids to be good at, you know, we all say, I mean, I haven't been to a school yet that doesn't tell me or have on the website, we want our kids to be good collaborators. Yet, how many of their faculty actually have a chance to collaborate? That's almost never. And how many of the kids really during the school day are collaborating? Right. Rare to never. And if they do any, it's after school, which is great. But if we want certain things, and, and I'm not here to tell any parent, any school, any district, any state, any country, 
this is what I think you should be good at. But I am here to say, think about what you want to be good at. What do you want your kids to be good at coming through this process of school? And then evaluate whether the learning experiences are aligned with that. I think that's fair, right? I think it's not somebody from abroad saying, I have decided all of your kids have to go to a four-year college or you're a failed school, you know, which by the way, a lot of people say, and I push back against uh, with a lot of energy, but I think it's fair. In my book, I highlight, for instance, um, when I'm in Wyoming, you know, one of their objectives for kids, and they had put a great deal of thought behind this, is they wanted their kids to come through K through 12 military ready. You know, who am I? I mean, I think that for... I admire a community that thinks about what they want to accomplish Mm. because we're going to create learning experiences that lead to that set of skills and mindsets in our, in our kids. And and that might not work for Cambridge, Massachusetts, but, but fair enough, like Cambridge, Massachusetts, figure out what they want for their kid. They probably all want all their kids to go to Harvard. I don't know, but you know, but, but I, I feel like it's not so it's, it's really important to let people play a leadership role in defining goals for themselves. Because what, what do we know, right? Let somebody set their own goals. They'll go to the ends of the, the earth to achieve them. Shove down their throat goals they don't believe in. Nobody does anything. You know, people don't respond to that. And so if we bring school communities together, let them play a role in saying, this is what we want to accomplish with our kids. And I've done a lot of these sessions at schools now, and it's really remarkable how creatively different what they express. I mean, they're all sort of have fundamental similarities. I mean, you know, they all sort of get at the the four five or six C's in some way, but I'm always blown away when you let a school community in their own words, say, this is what we hope our kids will be good at coming through the school process. They own it. They embrace it. And then if they start to make these small steps that are innovative and somebody grumbles about it, usually a parent, they're able to say, wait, we just came together as a community and said, we want our kids to be compassionate, and constructive citizens. Somebody, some groups say something like that. So therefore, we're doing this and this. You know, and then people say, oh, I get that. Yeah, that's good. Okay, I'm, I'm fine with that. That's it. That, that makes sense. And, then, and you give yourself cover and you let those innovative, te- you know, I would say, some teachers will sprint, some will run, some will walk, some will just stay in place. Don't spend time trying to make the teachers that really say this isn't for me or this isn't for me right now. Just ask them to respect the process and keep an open mind. But don't, don't drag down the entire process for everybody by making somebody do something they don't want to do. You know, let the people that are really itching to do it move forward. And, and what we find is it spreads, right? It, it, it is contagious. And when parents say, oh my gosh, my kid came home from school so excited, they had a chance to work on something where they defined the project and ran with it. They, back to the start, you know, they said, I want to design a bridge and look at the artistic merits of great bridges and, and structural design issues. And my school actually said, yes, my kid's so excited. You know, that sort of builds. And suddenly people start to say, my gosh, we can actually have kids come through school as creative, determined problem solvers who are finding their own way to contribute to make their world better. And that way can be a whole long list of things. And, and, and that's my problem with standardized tests and standardized criteria is that somebody's decided that the most important thing for every kid coming through our K-12 through system is to get into a, a better and better four-year college. And there are an awful lot of kids who don't particularly respond to or resonate with academics, who are told they're not very smart, who are told in many ways they're not, they won't be a first-class citizen if they don't go to a four-year college. And I kind of call bullshit on that. You know, like I respect all paths and I actually am skeptical that much of the academic path is actually retained by kids. And so, you know, so I don't feel like the downside is that great. I feel like letting kids define distinctive paths, some more pragmatic, some more traditional skills, some more, you know, like a whole range of things, but also equipping them to learn how to learn, right? I mean, like I find that the ultimate irony is if we really were serious about having kids develop a learning how to learn skill, they wouldn't need more and more years of costly formal instruction. You know, there's a story in the paper I posted about yesterday about, you know, all the kids going to getting PhDs that then are out of work. Well, you know, like why? They come through high school. The only thing they're prepared for is college. They go to four-year college. They can't get a job. So then they get a master's degree. They get a master's degree, can't get a job. They get a PhD. Hey, I got a PhD. So I'm dumping on myself as well. 
And, and then they say, wait a minute, I'm, after all these years and all this money, nobody wants to hire me. And they never along the way were encouraged or allowed even, empowered to find a problem you really care about and get good at something that will let you make, you know, make a really positive contribution to an issue, a problem, an opportunity. And, and that to me seems like it should be the heart and soul of school. Ted, I have a question. I, I, having been a principal for a number of years and leading, trying to lead some change initiatives toward what you're talking about, greater student engagement, um, agency, teacher engagement, parent involvement. And I think the grassroots effort is so important. But what role do you think business plays in this kind of change? Because clearly, Schools don't really exist in isolation. We want to be preparing students for future jobs and for future contributions in society. And people will say again and again, with all the technology available, we don't hire for skills, we hire for disposition. But I feel like, and I could be wrong on this, but business is not as vocal as they could be in saying what they need. And if that were more clear, then maybe at even a national level, you know, that conversation, the, the, what the success that people are having in their individual schools and systems might spread more across the whole country. Yeah. So two or three things that I'm set, you know, I'll come across as being sensitive to this issue, and, and I am, which is, you know, because I have a business background. And so when I first right. started spending time on education and somebody had introduced me to, to educators and say, Ted has a business background and he's now interested in education. I said, like, Boy, they don't look very happy about this. <laughs> and, and now I get it, right? You know, like, like most people in business bring this arrogance to the field of education because they went to school, so therefore they know what school should be all about. And I refuse to be introduced as an education expert, you know, like you guys are, but I am not. And um, I, I think I know how the world's shifting. I can't predict it in any specificity, but I feel like business is, has not done a very good job of respecting its potential positive role in overstepping. You know, and I'll say to people, hey, I've got a great idea, you know, particularly somebody in a leadership role, a CEO, I say, I've got a great idea. We're going to replace your board of directors now and, and have it entirely filled by, filled by teachers. How do you feel about that? And they'd say, well, well, what do teachers know about business? And I say, well, really not that much, but, but by the way, what do you really know about education? <laughs> you know, so, you know and, and I will say this, I think, I think business often in a sloppy way We'll just toss out there in the HR department, use a college degree as a first filter screening mechanism. Mm -hmm. And that is totally tilting the hiring process toward the rich. And, and in, in my books, I talk about different examples, but you know, like you can't get a job in enterprise rental car. You can't stand behind an airport desk and check people in and give them their rental car keys without a college degree. Well, you know, does that make a shred of sense? No, it doesn't. Um, oh, the, second, the second point I'd make is that I am... I am absolutely not in the camp of saying the whole point of education should be career. I, I just want to like triple underscore that. You know, I was a physics and English undergraduate, got a PhD in engineering. The only one of those that was useful to me in business was my English undergraduate degree. The rest of it was useless. Um, so I'm a big advocate for the liberal arts. I think it's important through school to educate kids to be informed, productive, responsible citizens. Yet we all say we do that. Yeah, and two thirds of, of adults in our country can't name the three branches of government. So, so broader sets of criteria, absolutely. But I will say this: if somebody goes to school for sixteen years and spends seventy-five to three hundred k, and has no ability to get a job, I say, like, how did that happen? You know, I mean, you, you can't spend that much time and money in school and leave without at least one hireable skill. You know, and it's not that developing a hireable skill needs to be everything. You know, like the, the reality is most of the classes kids take in high school and even in college, they end up saying they're of no use to them in the workplace. Most teachers I talk to, when I ask them about their college of education experience, say it was largely useless. I mean, it's one of the biggest complaints I hear. And so I look at that and I say, <laughs> there are big opportunities to rethink what we let kids get good at. And it's not either or. We, and, and in my book, I highlight a lot of kids as early as, as elementary school getting good at something they enjoy that if, they, if it weren't for child labor laws, they could make 3x the minimum wage with the skill. And so I say, wouldn't it be interesting if we just said every kid coming through K through 12 will leave having found a proficiency they enjoy 
that lets them make 3x the minimum wage. And then that wasn't six entire years, but that was maybe one elective and some after school applying the emerging proficiency, and then maybe a summer immersion. You know, like that seems like a really great goal. And then if they wanted to go to college, they could cover a lot of the costs with after school and, and summer. And if they didn't want to go to college or wanted to put it off for two or three years, they would have a great skill set coming out of K through 12 that would let them do something interesting instead of a crappy minimum wage job. Back to the role of business. So I think they should be far more focused on, you know, here's what we'd love to see. Because you know, when you look at these things, and they're not visible or front and center, but a, one example I use is Google, right? I mean, there's this enormous, you know, gulping the Kool-Aid sense in America that every kid needs to be a STEM student or they're not going to have a career, right? It's STEM or bust. I mean, you know, like, like you, you'll find articles all the time. And yet Google, when they look at what characteristics really lead to their best employees, STEM is 10th out of 10. You know, it's collaboration, it's leadership, <laughs> I was say empathy, collaboration. It's, yeah. it's curiosity. It's all these things that we could be equipping our kids with. Which is why, by the way, in my business career, I love to hire or fund, you know, anthropology majors or philosophy majors or dropouts or music or, you know, people that had the self-confidence to say, I'm not going to major in accounting because, you know, I don't care what the world thinks is a safe major. I'm going to major what I'm interested in. That's the first thing. The second thing is I find in general, if you go to businesses with a well-formed request, they will step up. They do care about their schools. They do have people in them that would be more than happy to help kids in school, help with internships, apprenticeships, but they need to be approached with a well-thought-out request. And so one of the things we're doing, back to this resource of small steps leading to big change, we're working on and we've been finding great examples around the country that make it a lot easier for schools to get started with small steps that could lead to a great internship program. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a big opportunity, you know, th th as I traveled, and there are some, there are some great career academies, but a few. Th that's not mainstream. And in a lot of places, the CT schools are viewed as like for those kids or whatever. Mm -hmm. I, I believe career academies would be great for all kids. And I, in my talks, I often use this video. Anybody listening can Google it. But, but it, people get nervous. They don't like this video that I show, but I show it because they don't like it. Um, and if you Google MIT graduation day light bulb wire battery, it, it was done by a long-term tenure professor at MIT who's skeptical that MIT graduates have learned much science or engineering. And to make the point, they interview these students on graduation day in cap and gown and ask them to light up a light bulb, given a bulb, a wire, and a battery. And they're initially indignant, and then they can't do it. And you know, the point I make is these were students who got a five on AP physics, a five on AP calculus BC, and 800 in the SAT. It's a 4.5 or higher honor suggested JPA, one of the six, seven, eight percent at MIT, four years at the most prestigious engineering institute in the country, world, and they can't light up a light bulb with a wire and a battery. And what if those kids in high school, instead of taking AP physics, had done an internship with a master electrician? Right. Would they, in fact, be better? Double E majors at an MIT, absolutely. Might they have considered, hey, I'm not that excited about academics, but being an electrician is actually a really interesting job with a lot of techn technology and entrepreneurship. Great path for a lot of people that often, all too often, you know, parents will kind of look down on, which I think is, is a real issue in America, right? You know, like a kid that finds a great path. In Finland, you know, when you go to Finland, half the kids self-select for the trades. And it's not the rich kids go to college and the poor kids go to the trades. It's equal across demographics. It's like parents are pretty relaxed. You want to be a master electrician? Cool. That's a neat thing to do. Interested in philosophy? Go to college. That's cool. It's like all paths are respected. I think we need to get that ingrained in what's going on in America. And, and to finish the point about businesses, I do find at some of these career academies, businesses do go to enormous lengths to donate people's time, equipment. Because they actually would love to have kids coming out of K through 12 who could plug in and do right. really interesting jobs in the right. local community. And those kids that did that for two or three years will often find the employer will pay for them to go to college. But we're in this incredible rush to get every 18-year-old into a four-year college. They often you know, don't make good use of that first year, two years. They often rack up an enormous amount of student loan debt not knowing what they want to accomplish. And it's all because we just, I think, as a society, 
are convinced our kids are going to be left behind if they don't go to a better and better four-year college. And we can't, couldn't dare let them take, even gap years. When I go to schools, particularly the rich schools, and suggest a gap year, kids say, oh, that'd be cool. And parents say, your kid, no. I mean, right, right, right. they might lose their momentum. They might actually stop thinking that they want to go to four-year college. And I say, well, if a gap year were all it takes for that kid to rethink whether a college path is the right path, I mean, isn't that a, that seems like a good thing. You know, but, but no, people were, you know, and they might, you know, we were talking before this about great design schools like Pratt, a kid that took a time off and actually worked in a real job might shift and say, I'm going to look for a more hands on, more interesting, more, a school that designs great, you know, combines great design with artistic, you know, like they might completely rethink their criteria and, and why not? I mean, like I'd much rather have a kid take two years and work and pick the right college, then take four years and leave with 75 to 300 K of student loan debt and say, I really, I got a minimum wage job. I still don't know what I want to do. And now I'm just mad that I've got the student loan debt it's not working. So um, this is going to sound like a conspiracy theory, but I, I, <laughs> I don't think I mean it to. Um, we talk in our book, Ted, about a lot of the changes that um, come from outside voices uh, well-intentioned outside voices, and they hit the they hit the schools. Um, I was a former high school history teacher, and I I was I was affected by um, uh, literature that somebody read about critical thinking. We need to do more critical thinking in the schools, or something else. And as Margaret will tell you, these become the the new shiny thing. And a lot of times, these ideas come from very well-intentioned. Um, um, higher ed uh, people writing about education. And it struck me when I was reading your book, and this is kind of where I'm getting to the conspiracy part, but again, I don't mean it to be, they're reinforcing what you call doing the obsolete things better, as opposed to doing better things. Yep. And I'm wondering in your travels uh, or in, in conversations with, with higher ed, um, especially, are you... Are you see, that just seems like a syndrome that needs to be broken or a paradigm that needs to be broken that yes they're trying to change education but they're trying to change it the way it is today in increments they're going around the edges as opposed to no let's stop and do something completely different do something better yep you know it's 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 you know it's sort of like across a broad spectrum of, of uh, our society so business uh, a lot of the narrative in, uh, in stories written about education, um, a lot, you know, like I had this exact discussion with the dean of a top college, uh, you know, school of education, where they'll just say, take it as a given that the key to improving education in America is better test scores, more graduate, more kids graduating high school, and more kids going to four-year college, you know, and, and a lot of uh, the charter school networks, and I'm, my film is about a charter school, I think there's some great charter schools, but a lot of the charter school networks, you know, basically beat their chest. We got X percent. We got all of our kids to go to four-year college. When I visit uh, high schools, particularly low-income high schools, you, you can't find spare space on a hallway that's not filled with a college pennant or a poster that in some way says you're not a first-class citizen unless you go to college. Or, you know, you too can be, you know, a, a person of worth, you know, by going to college. And so... So you look at that, and it's just like the, the, it's this oversimplification of what we need to do. And I think part of it is test scores are handy. You know, you'll see this wave every time the NAEP scores come out. It's like I, good example. And, and you know, I, I I do say things that sometimes are are uh, critical, and I'll be critical here. Is the NAEP scores came out, and everybody just did cartwheels because of Mississippi's miracle. Because right. fourth grade reading. reading scores went up by like, like whatever it was, but you know it's not like a massive jump. It's but it was the tops in the nation. Nobody sort of nobody peeled down below that to say, oh by the way, <laughs> since the last round of NAEP scores, they've implemented a program where you can't grad, you can't leave third grade unless you're reading at grade level. So suddenly the fourth graders who are getting tested are only the ones who had passed grading you know read, reading level in third grade. And so. So was the jump because of incredible teaching, you know, approach, you know, in Mississippi? I mean, no, you know, it's just like, come on. 
and so you look at that and it's, it, you just say, whoa, wait a minute. And, and one of the challenges, I think we all face this, is what if in a world where everything routine is done by machines, the most important things for young adults to get good at are the hardest things to measure? How do you mm. really measure creative problem solving? How do you really measure collaboration? You know, how do you really measure leadership? How do you really measure curiosity? You know, and, and I go after with a vengeance. And I feel like I'm on decent standing with this. But, but you know, the entire wasteland we call high school math. And it, it hurts people's feelings. And I feel terrible for the dedicated high school teachers out there trying to get kids excited about factoring polynomials. But honestly... The reality is, when you look at how many adults use any of the high school math they took, it's next to none. It's not even scientists and engineers who use it. And, and so if it's half of the SAT, if it's blocking a bunch of kids from graduating high school, if it's telling a bunch of kids they're dumb, and yet all those tests could be done perfectly if you just had a smartphone with photo math and you don't use it as an adult, to me, that means something is really wrong. I mean, I've given two, in the last four years, I've given two keynotes to large audiences of college admissions officers. So I ask them this question. I say, show of hands, how many of you would value an applicant who chose to take statistics and didn't take calculus? How many of you would actually view that as a big positive? None. And how many of you want to see calculus? All. So I walk them through it. And I say, I've spent five years trying to find one adult in America who uses professionally what's taught in high school calculus. You want to know what that answer is? Zero. Not at Boeing, not at 3D solid modeling companies, not at auto companies. No one does integrals or derivatives, but nobody does this stuff by hand. It's all done computationally. And so, yep, your mm -hmm. kids have learned how to do... Uh, uh, integration by parts or hyperbolic cosine transformations or whatever, it's all can be done with photo map, you know, on your, on your phone. How many adults would benefit from being good at statistics? I say, first of all, find me a business that wouldn't want to hire somebody good at statistics and data analytics. It is one of the most in-demand skills and capabilities you could have. Uh, to be a citizen, can you really parse a lot of what you see to be an informed citizen without a working knowledge of statistics? I don't think so. And think about almost every important personal decision you make, other than perhaps who you marry, that isn't based on understanding statistics, you know, medical, financial, whatever. So I say, like, it's interesting to me that you prefer the kids take something that no adult in America uses. And most of the time, that means they don't take something that's indispensable for citizenship and personal uh, decisions and an enormous career advantage. How, how do you justify that? I mean, how do you actually look at yourself in the mirror every morning and say, I'm happy that I'm telling kids to take something useless and discouraging them from taking something indispensable? And, and you know, they don't have an answer, right? Other than, other than, well, it gives us an easy way to compare the smart kids because most of the smart kids take calculus. Right. And I say, you know, like, we can do better than that, right? You know, like, memorizing the New York City phone book is hard, but you don't make that an application criteria. You know, I mean, come on. And, and so you look at this and you say, wait, what if we step back and said, what's actually useful as an adult and made that an important part of K through 12, an important part of college, instead of going from what's been there forever and carrying through? Because by the way, and this is where I'm on decent ground on this, is I, I have multiple lead author published papers that are math driven. I mean, I'm old enough that I started doing this work before you could do it. You know, you know, it wasn't available computationally. I still have on my desk a thousand page copy of Gradstein and Rizik's sub integration substitutions and spent six months trying to do closed form integrals by hand for a, what turned into two lead author published papers in the undergraduate in physics. So I understand that we used to live in a world where doing these things by hand mattered, but that world's gone, right? And, and it's a lot like saying you've got to learn how to take apart and put back together a carburetor before you can get your driver's license. Mm -hmm. And nobody steps back and says, oh, by the way, new cars don't even have carburetors anymore. Like it's, it, you know, when you were in the era, early era of car driving, you needed to be able to clean a carburetor because you might break down miles from a service station and have no other option. 
You don't need that today. And, and yet we never sort of say, boom, wait a minute, let's rethink this. And the problem is, is that so often, and here's where I have a great deal of empathy with teachers, people will say, well, of course, do everything you've always done, but now you need to do more. And, and it's not like our kids are doing nothing and our teachers are twiddling their thumbs. I mean, I go to schools, people are plenty busy. It's not that they have idle time. So when you say, oh, learn all this stuff that kids are never going to use as an adult, but also add X, Y, Z and A, B and C and whatever, whatever, whatever. You know, you just like at a certain point, you throw up your hands and say, wait a minute, somebody's got to set some priorities here. Mm -hmm. Somebody's got to bring some logic and sense to what matters and what doesn't matter. And, and I think, you know, how many schools till, you know, still teach kids footnoting, and, but don't teach them fact-checking, right? Fact-checking is enormously important. I can't find schools that teach fact-checking, but there's a website where you just put the, the quote in and it gives you back your perfectly formatted footnote. So I don't know. It's like, like what matters? How many adults actually write things? And we do because we're writing books. But I mean, how many adults listening actually write something in their daily life where they got a footnote? But, but how can our democracy hold together when almost no adult knows how to fact check? Priorities change. School needs to keep pace. So um, uh, l- let's use that to kind of um, uh, transition to a close here. Um, what would you say to a superintendent, a principal, a teacher who's listening? What would be a first step that you would ask them to take here, maybe to shift their thinking around, around change, around what they're doing in schools? I, so I would suggest starting with just asking this question. Would it be nice to think differently about school or is it imperative? You know, and, and what I say to people is, I don't know how many students you're responsible for. It might be three if you're, you know, few if you're a parent, you know, 50 to, to 150 if you're a teacher, bigger numbers as you, as you take bigger, you know, broader roles. Here's what, I, here's what I tell people. I say, I hate to be, you know, the skunk at the garden party. But if these kids come through school and all they're good at is memorizing material, replicating low-level procedures and following instructions, That's exactly what machine intelligence does instantly, perfectly for free. If that's the set of skills and mindset your kids have coming through school, almost all those kids are going to be flat out unemployed for most of their adult life, which means, you know, unless they inherit a pile of money, they're going to be homeless or they're going to be in jail or they're going to be turning to other things that aren't good. This is the fight of our lives. Mm -hmm. But until you get up every morning saying, Yes, I am in the fight of our lives. Yes, I can make a difference. And yes, I'm committed not to thinking about it, talking about it, complaining about it, but I'm going to start making real change in what I'm doing. And then we've got this resource. I mean, you know, we have one, I mean, you know, read your eyes book, go to, you know, uh, www.innovationplaylist.org or go to www.goboundless.org. You know, we give some suggestions for so what you could do tomorrow, right? Because one of the things I find is I go to a lot of these conferences or workshops or professional development sessions, whatever, and I'll say, how'd it go? And they say, oh, it was great. We had so many great conversations. And then a week later, you say, what changed? And the answer is nothing. And conversations don't give kids a fighting chance in life. Real change does. And we all know, we know if kids get good at defining their own goals, managing their own efforts, learning how to learn, developing skills that matter, retaining the same character dispositions we see in every toddler, you know, which is exactly what you want an adult, right? Inquisitive, you know, creative, you know, insatiable, you know, interest in learning, you know, willing to stare down failure a million times. It's all in our four and five-year-olds. If we could preserve that, give them proficiencies that matter, have them understand that they can actually get good at things that make their world better, and couple that with a way to sort of support themselves financially while they retain intellectual curiosity, it's off to the races. But it won't happen if, with conversations. It won't happen. And, you know, so I'd say to people listening to this, if, if any of this made sense, if you're still listening, you know, which, which should only be because you guys ask great questions, not because I had interesting things to say, but if you're still listening, I would say what the next school day, what's one little thing I'm going to do differently? And, and you know, there are great resources. We're trying to provide some things that are world-class. 
but if you already know, do it. You know, you know, one last thing, you know, Nellie Mae did this great study I talk about in my book where they talked, they interviewed a bunch of principals and said, what are ironclad state regulations that won't let you do what you really feel you need to do to benefit your kids? What are the things that absolutely hold you back? And they made, the principals made a a big list. Then they took researchers and went back and checked them. And out of all the things they listed, 70% weren't real. They didn't really exist. You know, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the people that say, well, someone else won't let me do it. That's just an excuse. You know, and the fact is, if kids can't wait to be in school every day, if kids' minds are racing when they're in school, if there's actually laughter coming out of the classroom and kids running around and they're interacting with each other and they're saying, this is cool. And you know, you visit schools, I visit schools. It doesn't take long to know when there's amazing learning going on. Because there's this bounce in the step of the schools and this sense of purpose in the teachers. And if we don't have that in our schools, we're letting these kids down, but we can do that. And so to me, that's the opportunity, but it won't happen with conversations or won't happen with complaints or won't happen with, well, we'll put it into a strategic plan and get to it next year. It will happen with a few people taking some small steps immediately and building some confidence and telling people, oh my gosh. You know, an example we have on our playlist is just this simple thing of giving kids a small block of time to come up with their own thought-provoking questions. You know, you would think, I thought, as I started asking rooms of educators, how many of you do this, that the answer would be most. You know, we, we pushed out the opportunity to ask questions in exchange for racing through content. And most of the time when I observe, particularly high schools, the only question kids ask is, will this be on the test? Right. So we have this simple starter step. Would some teachers in the school watch a 12-minute great video about what this is all about with some suggested ways to structure it and then set aside 20 minutes in a month to let kids come up initially on their own, then in small groups so nobody's embarrassed or feels like they're risking looking bad? Come up with your own thought-provoking questions. Simplest of all steps, but I call them Trojan ponies. Because once you start doing that and a few teachers do it and they come back and say, oh my gosh, my kids came to life. Kids that I thought were bored had great questions. This happened, that happened, the other thing. I actually did it this way. It was so much better, blah, blah, blah. Then it goes from six teachers to 12 teachers to 20 teachers. And it may never go to all teachers, but suddenly kids feel like their voice, their sense of curiosity is being respected and amplified. Small steps that lead to big change. And, And so, but don't think about it. Do it. Do it. And, 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 you know, because, you know, it's a long journey, but it, you never get there without taking that first step. And as I say, I, I feel like way too often we confuse conversation with real change. And there's no amount of talking about this that leads to change learning outcomes for our kids. And they trust us. We owe it to them. Let's do it. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining well, us. Thank you guys for what you're doing. You guys are heroes. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's really inspiring, I think, to me, certainly, but to everybody. So I really um, appreciate your taking the time to podcast books, doing all the things you're doing. Um, and it is, I think, the fight of our lives. So, uh, Ted, uh, when, when I publish um, the interview, um, uh, you'll hear at the very end of it, uh, the three of us are going to debrief. And we always publish our debriefs. Oh, okay, and, good. A and, surprise. A surprise for me. <laughs> I think I think our debrief could be as long as the interview. I mean, I've just I've got two pages of notes here. So thank you so much. This is it's it's inspiring. It's given me a lot to think about in terms of what we need to say and do about our book and 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 how we can further support educators. So yeah. thank you. And let me know when it comes out. I'll buy a copy uh, or you know you would rather help you with Amazon and buy a copy, but um, but let me know that, and then I'll I'll uh, tweet out about it. Although I get sick of Twitter, I get these, you know, like I, half of me. There are many times I say I should just flush every bit of social media. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you on that. Uh, it's a mess. Good. Well, good luck. Okay. So I will leave and let you guys do your debrief. But thanks for all you're doing. I really mean it. It's really great. All right. Thanks Thank so much. Ted. Thanks, thanks Ted. Ted. Take care. Yeah. Bye. I can. So um, that was uh, that was uh, Ted. Um, I don't think Ted needs to drink any coffee. I think he's just <laughs> that was awesome. He is man, what what passion! But I I just find myself in 
And maybe you guys noticed, I just felt nodding my head in agreement. I mean, just so much of what he said, I found just like really good. Um, I love this question. Is thinking about what's going on in schools nice or imperative? And that just, I, when, when you ask a simple question like that, or when you ask that question, yeah, it's imperative. And you tie it with machine intelligence does, does so much of what we used to do. Now you don't need to do that. So are we training kids for, for a world that no longer exists? Yeah, I, I really appreciated his distinction between knowing about a problem and even knowing what's right to do about that problem and actually doing it. And I think that it's, um, it's one of those, it's a human behavior that you think that by thinking about it and worrying about it and talking a lot about it and even planning a lot about it, it is doing it. And there's something very different than that. And the doing this has to happen in small steps and grow. And that's, that's how you make the shift. So to me, that distinction, like what does real change look like? What tends to happen in a social setting? What tends to slow people down versus what actually creates that spreading, I thought was really important. Yeah, that was, that, that was fascinating. I also um, thought a lot about what he said about, I love the fact that he's been out and done all this work in schools. And, but schools will always need to have a way to assess student learning. And it just made me think more than I have even in the past, how can, how can we assess these important skills of creativity, problem solving, citizenship, um, and, and the, just the huge need for educators. And I don't mean basically educators in schools or even forward thinking districts, but at the national level, think about how can we do this differently? Because what students need to learn is different than it used to be before. He talked so much about kind of obsolete knowledge and skills. Um, but we really have to be able to measure so that we can support these other important learnings. It's interesting that you say that because as he said that, I realized that there are emerging fields in neuroscience and psychology and sociology that do really have tests for some of these things. They just haven't been translated into a verifiable test you can use in a school setting. But this is technology that exists and needs to be translated into the school. So that's really cool. But this yeah. is also how schools get left behind and how we get, you know, not being able to keep up with the times. I, I, I'm thoroughly hoping that those do make their way soon into schools because Ted's right. This work is happening in places across the country and it's very exciting, but it can't just be in pockets. Right. But Margaret, you, you, you raised a good question about business and I can, I can tie I can tie that back to this, how do you measure question? Because in businesses, they are measuring some of these things. Now they're doing it qualitatively and there is a subjective nature to this. But if a business, if a business um, says that curiosity is critical to doing the work, if collaboration is critical, I can remember some of the things in our um, in, in some of the objectives that we had when we were working at Pearson Prentice Hall. We got into this area of of what we now call uh, the softer skills. They're not really soft skills. They're actually hard skills. But we were starting to measure. We were starting to to have to show. Well, how could how did you demonstrate collaboration, and what was the impact of that? So even if we don't have a hard measurement, if if we start to say that problem solving is important for kids and curiosity, we can start to measure that qualitatively by what they're doing and what the impact is of what they're doing. And I thought that your question about business, when, when you asked it, my brain leaped to something that was a little different than how he answered it. He talked about the connection between businesses and the students' career paths. Whereas when you asked the question, I was kind of thinking along these lines of measurement and thinking like, okay, so maybe at the national level, there is a, a need for 
businesses to go beyond just saying we need more collaboration to actually partner. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's what right. I heard. Is that what right. you were thinking of? Exactly. To clarify, to be, to articulate what it is they're looking for and how much they're looking for so that schools then can start, can, there starts to become more value in measuring those things. Well, it's interesting because I don't know that that's the business's main job, right? right. So like, how do, how do we as a society cr create that connection and, and make that happen? You're right. It's not the business's main job, but there are businesses who are saying we don't have enough people coming to us with these exactly. skills. So how do we communicate that on a national level to schools so that maybe the assessments change and we don't spend so much time assessing what's not really important? Right. Really cool. So if you were going to summarize... Um, if you were going to say, what's the essential message that he's giving here and really hone it down to one thing, what, what comes to mind? Wow. Do it. <laughs> yep. I, I would, I would say that. And the fact that take a critical look at what is obsolete, yeah. and get it out of the way yeah. so that you can do it. And so I'm going to try to tie those two things together. I, he used the word, I think he used the word agency once. Yeah. But what I find in, in listening to him and, and reading his book is that underlying a lot of what he's talking about is that teachers know, good teachers know what good instruction is. And they should be freed to do it. And kids need agency. They need to be given the opportunity to discover what's really important to them as learners and, and to have the school support them in that endeavor, not a free for all, but, but give them the opportunity to try to discover. And it gets to his thing about asking, having kids ask questions, right? Yeah. So I, I it was powerful, powerful hour for us. Yeah. So um, Margaret, thanks for joining us. And Thank um, you. okay. And join us next time on Getting Unstuck. Thanks, everybody. Bye.